Over the last couple months, the housing market has been basically dead. There's been hardly any news to report on because home sales hit their lowest level in a couple of decades in 2023 and things have kind of come to a, a freeze, a standstill, and the market's not really moving. You're not seeing major price increases or declines in most areas, and mortgage rates teased everybody looking like it was gonna go down, and it was gonna be you know, headed towards 5.5% by the end of this year, and now it's already back up to 7%. So we're in this situation of like a virtual standstill with real estate. But one thing I keep hearing over and over again is how the housing market is now more affordable because of how, how much the interest rates have come down. Like, it really hasn't moved, guys. It was down for a few weeks there. You know, it was on a downward trend. But it, it really didn't make a huge difference. You know, we saw these, all these stories talking about, oh, if you can afford $3,000 a month, now you can afford a house that's $40,000 more expensive. Yeah, maybe for a few weeks you could. And like I mentioned in a previous video, that only applies to people that make probably 120, 130 k a year or more because that's the only way you can afford a house that costs $3,000 a month. Really what I would wanna know as somebody who's been in real estate a long time is what's actually going on with pending sales and closed sales. And really only closed sales matter because if a bunch of pending sales fall through, they don't count. It's not a closed sale. The deal didn't happen. It didn't materialize, you know? So as far as I'm concerned, pending sales are still dead in the water. But let's take a look at some of the statistics anyways because right now, housing economists are pointing towards pending sales as a forward-looking metric that shows how much December had a substantial improvement. So let's take a look at the data straight from the National Association of Realtors from last year. When we look at this chart, you can see on the left-hand side, you have the seasonally adjusted pending sales data, and on the right-hand side, you have the raw data that's not seasonally adjusted. And so they're talking and claiming about how in December of 2023, you saw an 8.3% jump in pending home sales and a 1.3% jump over the year prior. But that's seasonally adjusted data. When you look at the raw numbers that's not finagled here, you can actually see that in December, the pending home sales were down 14.4% from the previous month and 1% from the year prior. So it looks like to me that things are still not really moving, guys. Things are still at a standstill, even though the news wants to paint the picture that things are recovering and turning around right now. Here we have a house for sale for almost 2.6 million, and they've actually been trying to sell this house since 2019 on and off. And no luck, obviously. Really haven't budged on the price either since 2021, so it's probably gonna be sitting here indefinitely, but at least it's not a flip. They've actually owned this house since 1991. They bought it for $230,000. Their property tax bill is lower than mine at $4,600 a year for this huge house that's supposedly worth 2.6 million, but really it's probably worth closer to 2 million, otherwise they would have sold it by now. And I know so many people out there are just waiting to see home prices come down and waiting for the price declines. And I actually came across um, a story today talking about 32 different cities across the country where home prices are now cheaper today than they were a year ago. And I'm not gonna read them all to you, but I will read some of the top ones here because some of them are pretty substantial. You know, you have Jackson, Mississippi down 14.1% year over year. Cleveland, Ohio down 8.6% year over year. Naples, Florida, down 5.9% year over year. Akron, Ohio, down 5.6% year over year. Punta Gorda, Florida, down 5.5% year over year. And the list goes on, really. But another thing to keep in mind with these numbers is these are year over year price declines. In a lot of these areas, if you go look at the peak of the market of when it was the most expensive back in the middle of 2022, things have probably come down more substantially because I saw Austin on this list and it was way towards the bottom at like 1.6%. But we know in reality that home prices in Austin, Texas have come down like 16, 18% since their peak in 2022. So you can't just look at the year over year figures. You have to look at how much have things come down since it was at its most expensive. So there are a lot of places out there 
where real estate is getting cheaper, guys, but I understand it's not enough to move the needle yet. You know, just like these small reductions in the interest rates is not enough to move the needle really when it comes to affordability. Things are still far out of reach for the average person. I get that. But the National Association of Realtors, they keep pumping out this basically fake information talking about how you know the housing market's off to a good start this year as consumers benefit from falling mortgage rates that's directly from the mouth of lawrence yun who's the chief economist over there at national association of realtors guys let me know in the comments have you benefited so far from this this housing market in 2024 have these lower mortgage rates, so to speak, actually done anything for you? Has it incentivized you to go out and buy? Are the prices in your area down enough to make you feel like you're getting a deal? Let us all know because I'm pretty sure this is not the reality for most people out there who are looking to buy a home. They're also saying here that a growing economy that is adding jobs and paying workers well will help Americans afford to buy a home. Job additions and income growth will further help housing affordability, but increased supply will be essential to satisfying potential demand. Well, yeah, no kidding. We need more supply. There's no question about it. But how many people out there are making substantially more money now where they can afford the median price home, guys? Because as of the 2022 census data, the median household income is about 75K a year, which is not anywhere near what you need to actually afford the median price home. And see, they, they constantly want to sell you the narrative that prices everywhere are going up, which is actually not true, because like I said, there's a list of 32 cities from realtor.com showing where prices have been declining. But National Association of Realtors comes out and says, uh, you know, that 90% of America's metropolitan areas saw price increases this week. Like, what? what do you mean this week? Like, <laughs> Real estate's a very slow moving thing. You can't go by what, what prices are doing week to week. That sounds like a joke to me. I can't believe they even said that. Here's where the real problem is if you ask me, guys. Listen to this. A lack of inventory is forcing buyers to compete for what's available and in the process push prices up. Now, this is where everyone's getting it wrong. If you haven't seen this new movie yet, it's called Dumb Money. I highly recommend you go watch it because it's, an, it's basically the story of how all of these regular people like you and me crushed all these billionaires by pumping up the value of GameStop stock. Back in 2021 and 2022, they had a huge run up because of a YouTuber actually, a YouTuber you know, was very bullish on GameStop and he had his whole theory of why the stock was undervalued and it was gonna to continue to go up. And he was pouring all his money into this stock, right? And he was encouraging or he was, he was keeping all of his investments public so everybody who watched his channel could follow along and, and do the same essentially if they wanted to. And so what happens is a bunch of people actually did this. They bought the GameStop stock and the stock rose tremendously, guys. In the movie, it went over like $300. On my stock app here on my phone, it shows it went up to about 58 at its peak, okay? And today, it's trading at around 14, so it's down substantially from its peak, but if you go back to the five-year history of this stock, it's still trading way higher than it was before this whole run-up, okay? Before the run-up, it was at a dollar a stock. Now it's at $14 per share. Okay, so that's very good. But the point of the story is this. These average people were able to put billionaires and big Wall Street investment companies out of business, guys. You know, people that were literally extremely rich and they were shorting GameStop stock became broke in the span of a, a year because of this run-up, okay? Because they were shorting the GameStop stock. And then you say, Michael, what does that have to do with real estate? Well, I'll tell you in just a second. Here we have a house for $9.8 million, and it's a story of a flipper selling to a flipper selling to a flipper. Look at this. They sold it in 2013 for $1,045,000. Then it sold a year later in October of 2014 for $1.33 million. So that guy walked away with a quick $330,000. 
Then he tore down the house, built this brand new house, tried getting four, five and a half million in 2020, ended up selling it in 2021 for 4.9. Now the current owner's trying to flip it again for 9.8 million with no luck. But I guess it takes a long time to find somebody to spend this crazy amount of money. And the property tax bill here is a whopping $81,000 a year for an empty mansion. Unbelievable. Talk about money laundering. So what this has to do with real estate is back to the prior sentence that we read a little bit ago. A lack of inventory is forcing buyers to compete for what's available and in the process push prices up, okay? But if you watch this movie and you see what happened, what did people do? They banded together, they all bought the GameStop stock, okay? They held on to it even when the value would fluctuate and go down a little bit and then in the end, a lot of them made a fortune and it's all because people worked together you know they worked against wall street and this this same principle can be applied right now in the housing market if everybody who wants to buy a home would purposefully boycott the market guys like even if you can afford to buy and you want to buy if everybody just said we're not going to buy what that would do was it would squeeze the market just like in this movie okay only with real estate. It would cause so many homes to pile up for sale on the market and prices would have no choice but to go down. That's what we actually need to happen. We need to have a coordinated effort just like the GameStop scenario where people just stop buying homes on purpose. Let's say for like six months, you know, and let all that inventory sit there and build and nobody's closing anything. Think about how many real estate companies and real estate agents would go out of business because they're not making commissions for six months. Think about all of the home sellers who are desperate and want a fast closing on their home are sitting there with no buyers coming through the door and no offers. Think about what that would do to the price of their house. Think about how low they'd be willing to sell it if they really truly were desperate and needed that money. Now those are some extreme examples to think about but it just gives you an idea of the power that people could have if people could work in a coordinated effort with each other. But everybody just can't get over this whole obsession with mortgage rates. Everybody's just obsessed with when are the mortgage rates going to come down? When is the Fed going to cut rates? And then I'll be able to afford to buy something, guys. Like this is just nonsense, okay? Everybody should be worried about the price of the house. Now I know the odds of this happening are basically slim to none and I don't have enough people watching my videos, I don't think, to actually make a dent in this housing market and you know have enough people actually do this but if it could if it could happen guys if people could just work together for a little while everybody could get what they wanted and they would be able to have home prices come down now when people jump back in the market would prices shoot back up maybe depending on how many people jumped in but once people realized the power they have and saw how much prices came down people might be able to show more restraint who knows but i realize that's basically a dream scenario that's probably never going to happen but it's not impossible and this movie proves it and it's, it's just a movie based on something that really happened and all these people that invested in the gamestop stock they wanted badly enough to increase their fortune, to increase their net worth. And they believed, guys. They, they kept invested in this stock and it paid off for a lot of different people. I think the main guy from the, the YouTube channel that started this whole thing, his net worth today is like over $30 million, something like that, just because of you know investing in the GameStop stock. So it's incredible. But the good news is that inventory is slowly on the rise according to realtor.com and a lot of people don't think that this housing market is going to recover anywhere near normal until we see mortgage rates at or below five percent guys and even then that's still substantially higher than it was that pushed the prices way up to begin with so who knows if that's even true now speaking of real estate one thing that the biden administration wants to do is they want to make residential real estate transactions more transparent by forcing all of the people that buy 
homes for cash here in the United States with a corporation need to disclose who actually owns the corporation. And the main goal here is to try and defeat the money launderers essentially because you know, re US real estate is considered a safe haven across the world for people looking to invest, including people looking to invest illegal money. And I'd be willing to say like here in Miami, probably 30% of these houses are money laundering machines, guys. That's why you see all these crazy expensive houses that we're walking by here and half of them are just sitting empty. Like who's buying that? Who's, you know, people always ask them in the comments, like who has the money to do this? Probably Colombian drug dealers is my guess. <laughs> But they consider all cash purchases a high risk for money laundering in residential real estate. And right away I think like, well, this law actually comes through, then all these guys have to do is just start financing these purchases instead and don't have to pay all cash, you know? And then once they get the loan, they just go ahead and pay it off after it's all done. And it's kind of like paying cash. We'll pay a little extra, you know, paying for the loan processing and the closing costs and all of that. But do you think somebody who's spending millions of dollars to launder money cares about those extra fees? Of course not. So right away, there's a big hole in this whole plan right there is they can just finance and pay it off later. But one of the reasons they wanna do this is not only to cut back on the illegal activity with it, but they say that when they find money laundering investments in real estate, that it can push prices in the area up anywhere between three and a half to seven and a half percent. And I'd be willing to say in areas like here in Miami that it can push prices far higher than that. And so now there's a new requirement in case you didn't know, like anybody who has a corporation in the US, if you own any kind of corporation, you're now legally required to register it with FinCEN. I even got this uh, notice as well because I have two corporations, one for my real estate business and one for my YouTube business. And so I have to register this information so that the government knows that I own these corporations. And if you don't do it, there's going to be stiff penalties for not doing so. So supposedly this whole effort is supposed to send a clear message to criminals that are looking to do money laundering here in the U.S. that our U.S. real estate's no longer going to be an option. So let's see if this is going to have any impact at all on the market. I don't think so, especially because people who are money laundering probably are buying these expensive houses, guys, like we're walking by. They're not buying, you know, the average starter home that most people are priced out of right now. That's the baby boomers you can thank for that and mom and pop landlords and Wall Street landlords. Those, they're the ones who are buying all those houses. Now, speaking of houses, in order to own a house, you need to have homeowners insurance and every time i hear one of these crazy stories about homeowners insurance i always have to share it with you guys because it's a tip right it helps you learn from other people's mistakes or just things that happen to them sometimes it's not even a mistake it's just bad luck or whatever but if you know that this can potentially happen to you you can avoid it right one of my viewers wrote me recently saying that he had a minor flood in his basement and he has State Farm home for homeowner's insurance. So he called State Farm to check on his deductible. He decided it wasn't gonna be worth filing a claim, probably because the repair was under the amount of the deductible. Or even if the repair was slightly higher than the deductible, it still might not be worth it by having a claim on your house, and then they might raise your premium or drop you since that's been happening to so many people. But what they did, what State Farm did when he called them, he found out after the fact that the company entered his details of his phone conversation into a centralized database and the subsequent buyers of his house asked him why he tried to hide the claim history on his house. Because the title company, when they were doing the title search for his home, they found this supposed insurance claim that he'd never made. And so just because he called State Farm to discuss the potential of a claim, never even actually made a claim, this information was entered into an insurance database that ended up later getting picked up by a title company as a potential insurance claim on the house, guys, that wasn't disclosed to the buyers. How crazy is that? And he's like, you know, Michael, the lesson learned here is you can't trust these guys. You cannot talk to them over the phone about any concerns you have with making a claim. Unless you're calling in to actually make a claim, don't discuss anything like this with them. So now you can't even discuss the possibility of making a claim without it showing up on a title search, guys. How crazy is that? And I guarantee you that the new buyer of this, of this guy's home probably is gonna be paying more 
for insurance, not just because they paid more for the house, but because that a claim was discussed in the past. That's what this is coming down to right now. I also want to clarify something that I saw in one of my videos recently. Um, I made a video about how so many people are using buy now, pay later to finance their alcohol purchases. I made this video about a week ago or so, and I saw so many comments of the same comments saying, oh, this has been happening forever, you know, since people could buy alcohol with credit cards, or that's the same thing as a bar tab. It's not the same thing, guys. Buy now, pay later is different than credit card purchases. This is when you walk into a place and you don't pay anything, okay? You put it on this buy now, pay later account, and it's kind of like a tab at the bar, but you have to pay it back later with interest, okay? So it's not the same as putting it on the credit card. This is an additional form of debt on top of the credit card, on top of the bar tab, okay? That's what people need to understand, that you got so many people out there buying things on buy now, pay later, which is an additional way to keep purchasing items that has been gaining a tremendous amount of popularity because of how broke everyone is. And speaking of people being broke, somebody else also mentioned, they said, wait until you notice that single people who file a simple tax return end up owing money for the first time in their career lifetime. I've been working for over 20 years filing single, and this is the first year I owe taxes. So get ready for that, guys, because tax season is right around the corner. And if you're already hearing stories like this, people that have been filing single for 20 years now having to owe taxes that used to get a refund, look out for that. That might end up being you. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you don't want to wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.